Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. They had agreed to make their wedding journey in the simplest and quietest way, and as it did not take place at once after their marriage, but some weeks later, it had all the desired charm of privacy from the outset. When did you become Blanche from the Golden Girls? I was born her, but then I became Averill, but I can revert back at any time. How much better, said Isabel, to go now when nobody cares whether you go or stay than to have started off upon a wretched wedding breakfast, all tears and trousseau, and had people wanting to see you aboard the cars. Now there will not be a suspicion of honey moonshine about us. We shall go just like anybody else. And she took Basil's cheeks between her hands. It was rather a girlish thing for Isabel. And she added with a conscious blush, we are now past our first youth, you know, and we shall not strike the public as bridal, shall we? My one horror in life is to be an evident bride. I don't know, Basil said presently, with as much gravity as a man whose cheeks are clasped between a lady's hands. You don't begin very well for a bride who wishes to keep her secret. If you behave this way... They will put us into the bridal chambers at all the hotels. And so, the marriage and honeymoon of the fictional Isabel and Basil, the protagonist in William Dean Howell's 1883 novel entitled Their Wedding Journey, began. Isabel was desperate not to be seen as a newlywed bride on her honeymoon, lamenting that to be seen as such was her one horror in life. But go on a grand honeymoon, they did. On the list of stops on their northern tour was the ubiquitous Niagara Falls, the honeymoon capital of the world. Howells writes that, quote, Isabel's heart beat with a childlike exultation as they pulled into the train station. She was anxious to see the queens of the cataracts as the falls were known. A cataract being a large waterfall in this context, not the thing that you get in your eyes. However, Isabel's hope to not be outed as a bride were dashed when they were, quote, received at the hotel with a burst of minstrelsy from a whole band of music, complete with trumpets and a crash of cymbals. Luckily, as soon as they were inside, the music started up again for another couple dismounting their carriage outside the hotel doors. During their first venture to the foot of the falls, Isabel noticed Two hopelessly pretty brides with parasols and impertinent little boots whom their attendant husbands were helping over the sharp and slippery rocks. But in noticing how the falls looked, Isabel forgot them as she looked on that dizzied sea, hurtling itself from the high summit in huge white knots and breaks and masses and plunging into the gulf below while it sent continually up a strong voice of lamentation, and crawled away in vast eddies with somehow a look of human terror, bewilderment, and pain. Howells continues that Isabel and Basil in Niagara Falls, quote, were now part of a great circle of newly wedded bliss, which involving the whole land during the season of bridal tours may be said to show the richest and fairest at Niagara, like the costly jewel of a precious ring. He goes on to describe the falls as almost abandoned to bridal couples, and anyone out of his honeymoon is in some degree an alien there and must discern a certain immodesty in his intrusion. Is it for his profane eyes to look upon all that blushing and trembling joy? A man of any sensibility must desire to veil his face and bowing his excuses to the collective rapture, take the first train for the wicked outside world to which he belongs. And thus, Isabel and Basil completed one part of the marriage ritual for middle and upper class 19th century citizens, the honeymoon trip to Niagara Falls. But why was Isabel so horror-stricken when faced with being outed as a bride? 
And why, in 1883, did this fictional couple travel to Niagara Falls on their honeymoon in the first place? Historian Karen Dubinsky, in her book, The Second Greatest Disappointment, which much of this episode is based on, labels the honeymoon as the public declaration of heterosexual citizenship. It is the point in which sexual intercourse between heterosexual partners is celebrated and endorsed. But like all things on this podcast, everything has a history, even this little vacation called the honeymoon and its fascinating tie with Niagara Falls. So let's take a look. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Avril. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. We began this episode with Basil or Basil, however you want to say it. I'm going to say it Basil because I'm from Texas. So Basil and Isabel, a fictional newlywed couple who traveled to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon in 1883. Another fictional fan favorite couple is good old Pam and Jim from The Office. The 2000s version of the quote every man or every working to middle class white couple Pam and Jim were to the aughts what Rachel and Ross were to the 1990s. Will they get together? Can they stay together? In 2009, Pam and Jim finally tied the knot, making the mistake, albeit the hilarious mistake, of inviting their entire office to their wedding in Niagara Falls. While getting ready for the ceremony, Pam tears her wedding veil and in a panic calls Jim in tears. He meets her in private and they lament over their choice to invite everyone to their wedding. To make Pam feel better about her torn veil, Jim cuts off half his tie and they hug and they kiss. In the next scene, we see them running away from the church together. While family and friends wait anxiously at the church, Pam and Jim have eloped on a Maid of the Mist tour boat and are married by the ship's captain amidst the spray from the falls above. Pam is wearing her wedding dress on the boat and she is visibly pregnant. Clearly, Pam does not feel Isabella's trepidation about being outed as a bride. Even for Niagara Falls, it's pretty rare to see a woman in a bridal gown at the falls. 126 years passed between Isabel and Basil's honeymoon and Pam and Jim's nuptials. A lot changed, yet a lot stayed the same, particularly the connection between newlyweds and the falls. Niagara Falls became a city synonymous with heterosexual sex. In the 1955 movie To Catch a Thief, Cary Grant says to Grace Kelly, Quote, what you need is 10 minutes with a good man at Niagara Falls. Now, watching this in 1955, everyone knew that Grant wasn't talking about sightseeing. He was talking about sex. It's pretty gross because basically he's saying that what she needs is a good thing. So she'll shut the hell up and relax a bit. It's evidence of rape culture that's ingrained in our vernacular. But besides the misogyny, the audience knew he was talking about sex. Niagara Falls and sex were synonymous. So how did Niagara Falls and heterosexuality become intertwined? A look at the history of tourism in Niagara Falls gives us some clues. The Niagara Falls honeymoon was always reserved for those with the cultural quote-unquote right to be there, namely married heterosexual couples. Yet some of the most famous gay men of the 19th century, including Oscar Wilde and Walt Whitman, traveled there with their partners. Oscar Wilde said of the falls very cheekily, quote, Every American bride is taken there, and the sight of the stupendous waterfall must be one of the earliest, if not the keenest, disappointments in American married life. The modern honeymoon evolved from the 18th and early 19th century upper-class custom of the wedding tour, also known as the bridal tour. This extended tour or vacation was for the bride and groom, but they were often accompanied by relatives. The traveling party would also visit other relatives who were not able to attend the wedding. By the mid-19th century, the wedding tour became a regular feature of middle-class weddings, but it was quite different from modern-day honeymoons. It was not a private romantic getaway for two people, but instead a way to affirm the bonds between two people and their families and their wider social network. 
the private bridal tour, what we would now consider to be the honeymoon, didn't become a regular occurrence until around the 1870s. Often the association of Niagara Falls as a honeymoon destination is attributed to Aaron Burr's daughter Theodosia when she visited the falls with her husband in 1801 after their wedding. It's also attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, Jerome, taking his new bride to Niagara Falls in 1803. However, historian Elizabeth McKenzie dates the honeymoon craze to the late 1830s, as scattered references in travel writings from the 1830s and 40s refer to honeymooners at the falls. However, the tourist industry started at the falls right after the War of 1812. In 1822, a man from Buffalo, New York, built the first hotel there, the six-story pavilion, and he built it on the Canadian side of the falls. Immediately, he fenced his property so that only paying hotel guests could view the falls from his vantage point. Their first hotel on the U.S. side was the Eagle Hotel. The opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 brought more visitors, as did the opening of the Welland Canal in 1832, followed by construction of railroads and bridges linking the two countries together during the 1840s and 50s. By the 1840s, Niagara Falls had roughly 40,000 visitors per year. Before the Civil War, the Southern aristocracy liked to visit Niagara during season to escape the harsh summer months and see and be seen by the U.S. elite. During the mid-19th century, those that could afford it went to Niagara Falls. It was usually a stop on a quote-unquote northern tour, like the grand European tour many elites took. Other stops on these northern tours included trips to Quebec City, New York City, and Boston. The upper and middle classes felt that consuming nature, taking in with quiet contemplation the sublime essence of places like Niagara Falls, demonstrated quote-unquote good breeding. For many, the main objective was quiet contemplation of the waterfalls. To really do Niagara, one must stay for a long extended period of time and watch the falls in odd silence from different vantage points and in different lights if possible. However, not everyone consumed the falls in the same way, and a kind of kitsch, or as upper-class patrons would complain, a rabble, uh, enjoyed the falls in different ways. The famous waterfall jumper Sam Patch jumped the falls in 1829. Charles Blondin, or the Great Blondin, one of the 19th century's most popular daredevils, performed a high-wire act over the falls in 1859 and again in 1860. In 1876, Maria Spelterini crossed the falls on a high-wire, but she had her feet encased in peach baskets while she performed the stunt. <laughs> what the fuck? Why? As one does, because peach baskets are more comfortable. Well, she had to one up the great Blondin, right? And she did. So she's doing that one better. Her feet are in peach baskets. Peach baskets, son. Buddy. Mm, mm, mm. (laughs) Her peach basketing wasn't the only one up that she did. She also wore skin colored tights and a short tunic while she did it. Grr. Simply scandalous. Simply. And if you're wondering about the peach or the skin colored tights, listen to our episode on Anthony Comstock because there's a whole thing about just the scandal of women like wearing these skin colored leggings. <laughs> Ridiculous. The first person to go over the falls in a barrel and survive was 63-year-old school teacher Annie Taylor in 1901. Niagara Falls was the subject of numerous plays and novels. P.T. Barnum's American Museum exhibited a scale model of the falls, and in the 1850s, a traveling panorama show took, uh, featured a 1,000-foot-long canvas roll that depicted images of the falls. Um, is that the? I think that might be the one that's in the Niagara Falls... Canada History Museum. Is it? I want to say yes. I just went there with students in the fall, and there is like a a huge panorama of the falls in the museum. I mean, I know that there were multiple ones, 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is, but yeah. So they would like unroll these while they were playing music and like the lights would be dimmed and they'd have kind of like, you know, lights shining just on things. So it's like sitting there watching a movie yeah. in a way How as, wild. They, as they unrolled this canvas and it scrolled by, you know, and apparently it took an hour and a half for it to unroll for this particular one. Yeah. It's wow. like a movie length watch in the falls. Yeah, I'll pay my two hay pennies. <laughs> Trips to Niagara Falls filled 19th century travel writings as well. Charles Dickens visited the falls um, in mid-century and his travel writings, uh, his journal was published in 1824 so I guess that's a little before mid-century, but it was repackaged like over and over in guidebooks and travel books and things like that. Uh, writers often described the falls as female, as beautiful, dangerous, and alluring. Um, the falls were the queen of the cataracts or the mother of all cascades or the water bride of time. One visitor described the falls as a woman, quote, I never looked at it without fancying I could trace in the outlines the indistinct shape of a woman, her flowing hair and drooping arms veiled in drapery. How strange. <laughs> well, and you heard at the top of the show how uh, Howells described this thundering, pulsing, uh, very uh, describing it in very sexual terms, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there was no shortage of sexual imagery when describing the falls. The mist from the falls was described as a kiss. The sound of water rushing was a moan. Islands rest on the bosom of the waterfall, and the soft shales of the cliff gradually yield before the attack of rushing water. The clinging curves of water embrace the islands and the water writhes and gyrates <laughs> and caresses the shore. The whirlpool is passionate. Niagara was seductively restless and tries to win your heart with her beauty. George Hawley wrote in 1872, Niagara was, quote, like a beautiful and true and excellent and admirable mistress. The Stop with the southern accent. I can't. That's the only people I can think who have mistresses. I'll do British. Like a beautiful and true and excellent and admirable mistress, the faithful lover may return to it with ever new delight, ever growing affection. <laughs> One poem published in 1901 describes the exquisite pleasures of Niagara in no uncertain terms. Nymph of Niagara, sprite of the mist, with a wild magic my brow thou hast kissed. I am thy slave, and my mistress art thou, for thy wild kiss of magic is still on my brow. People are so weird. I'm like, oh, sexy water, yeah. <sighs> the falls could invoke sexual feelings inside young lovers, of course. In Agnes Machar's 1894 book, Down the River to the Sea, the protagonist May joined a group of young Canadians on a holiday journey to Niagara Falls. May meets Hugh on this trip and is initially shy around him. However, after their very first look at the falls together, described as a, quote, curving, quivering sheet of thundering surge. <laughs> May feels much less shy around Hugh and notices his physicality for the very first time. She is mesmerized by his heightened color and the absorbed expression of his dark blue eyes. Hugh also feels a change and tells May, quote, I never felt as if I had got so near the state of self-annihilation. The nirvana we read about. <laughs> As the novel progresses, Hugh proposes marriage to May and asks her to travel down the river of life together. Oh my god, self-annihilation? Be sure to go and return to our episode on Le Petit Mont and how that means... Oh, yeah. Orgasm. That's right. We got, we got, we're going to have lots of links in this one. 
So Dubinsky maintains that Niagara Falls undoubtedly made visitors think about sex, but the creation of the place as a honeymoon Mecca was a complex process that brought together several strands, its reputation as an elite tourist resort, its proximity to a large concentrated population that being Buffalo at the time, um, and changing mores about the honeymoon itself. So cultural depictions of Niagara as an icon of beauty, which were much more likely than not expressed in terms of gender and heterosexual attraction. And then the forbidden pleasures of sexuality, romance, and danger that countless travelers experienced while gazing at or playing with the waterfalls. The first North American hotel to feature a honeymoon suite for public viewing was New York City's Irving Hotel in 1847. The New York Tribune described the suite as a fairy boudoir decorated in lace and satin. Thus, the private honeymoon, even though not as in vogue as it would be in later years, was still an illusion. Dubinsky points out that the privacy of a honeymoon suite was, like the honeymoon itself, designated for the exclusive use of newlyweds, and that was inconsistent with reality, as honeymooners like Isabel and Basil found out when they were outed at their Niagara Falls hotel. Even as early as 1841, a popular song called Niagara Falls, which, can we just... How is a song about Niagara Falls a popular song? Anyway, um, this pokes fun at young lovers at the falls. Oh, the lovers, they come a thousand miles. They leave their home and mother. Yet when they reach Niagara Falls, they only see each other. Each other. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to harmonize with, harmonize with you. <laughs> So Foucault, that French theorist that everyone loves to hate, contested the traditional notion of linear time. He argued that spaces like the honeymoon exist as an alternative space in time, varying under different historical circumstances. So the space is what he called a heterotopia, as opposed to a utopia, which is fundamentally an unreal or an unattainable space. So heterotopias are linked with a break in traditional time, identifying spaces that represent either a, a kind of quasi-eternity, so a place like a museum, or are um, temporal, so like a fairground, right? Heterotopias are not freely accessible. So in the case of like a museum or a fair, fairground, you know, you pay entrance, whatever. Um, but they are entered into either by compulsory means, such as say a jail, or their entry is based on, you know, like a, like paying a fee or based on a ritual or purification, like a wedding and then a honeymoon, right? So we don't want to get too deep into the theory here, but I think it's interesting to think of the honeymoon as this alternative space and time, the heterotopia of a space like the honeymoon, the space and time when a bride is theoretically deflowered is simultaneously mythic and real. So if we follow Foucault and his thinking here, the honeymoon is a restricted or a forbidden space that is set aside for two people, but the outside world has a strong desire to look inside. In Victorian culture that considered sexual relations only permissible inside the bonds of marriage, the marriage ceremony provided couples with the ritual to then step into the space, the honeymoon space, of becoming full sexual adults. Dubinsky argues that for Victorian middle and upper class couples, the private honeymoon was a way to harmonize the sheer embarrassment of having all of your friends and family know that you're about to get it on. And this really important life event of stepping into full heterosexual adult citizenship within a culture that demanded sexual modesty. Since at least the 1880s, marital experts decried the, quote, harassing wedding tour, which was deemed both physically debilitating and immodest for the bride. It exposed the couple, particularly the bride, to the gaze of the public. So this was kind of one of Isabel's fears, right? She didn't want to be exposed to the gaze of the public. 
Um, and so therefore taking in the sights of nature held out great promise as a honeymoon destination as quote unquote nature was inherently private. So thus romance, sex, and danger were incorporated into ideas about Niagara Falls during the 19th century, thus becoming kind of this honeymoon destination. However, the naturalness, quote unquote, of the falls did not mitigate lewd jokes. H.G. Wells joked in 1905 that the roaring of the falls was a cover to the, quote, noisy accessory to the artless lovemaking that fills the surrounding hotels. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, H.G. Wells. Historian Jonathan Katz argues that the 1920s was when the quote-unquote heterosexual came out, so to speak. In the first years of the 20th century, heterosexual and homosexual were still obscure medical terms, not yet standard English. In fact, it wasn't until 1923 that the word heterosexuality even made it into Webster's Dictionary. In a way, it was to differentiate heteroeroticism for the opposite sex from homosexuality, which made it into Webster's 14 years earlier. Gradually, heterosexuality the 20th century came to refer the to increasing quote, public normal acceptance of a new free of hetero any essential pleasure ties principle. to procreation. Eroticism was placed, quote, at the core of modern personality. Essentially, the value placed on sexuality and the formation of identity and personality made sexual attraction much more central to male female coupling. The increased importance of sexual expression reshaped the institution of marriage as couples began to expect that erotic fulfillment was an integral part of a successful alliance. The dominant image of the 1920s woman was that of youth and romance. Hollywood films and dime novels showed young women meeting their Prince Charming while being his equal and his friend. An emphasis on being attractive to men and marrying a good man was not a new standard imposed on women during the 20th century, but what was changing was the added, more overt sexuality, which put the heterosexual couple at center stage of the subjective existence. The cultural emphasis on heterosexual romance and marriage, the heterosexual imperative, particularly denigrated non-married women. Historian Carol Smith-Rosenberg argues that sex reformers, doctors, and psychologists redefined the issue of female autonomy in sexual terms during this period, meaning that women who competed with men for economic independence and political power were labeled mannish lesbians. In 1926, lesbians. an American travel newly writer term marveled that all of the brides and grooms that he saw in Niagara autonomy. Falls. And as Dubinsky characterized it, went on to write a long and upbeat story about the happy state of heterosexual romance in his day. He determined that young people had supposedly lost the shame in advertising that they were on their honeymoon, writing, quote, young people nowadays ain't ashamed of being married. Of course, not all agreed, and some were still moored to an older mentality of attempting to hide their newly married status. In 1918, the protagonists of the book Some Honeymoon discover to their chagrin, quote, a newness sticking to bridal couples that no amount of deception can hide. A big change that took place during the early part of the 20th century was that the groom now seemed to be just as embarrassed by the scrutiny of well-wishers as the bride. The 19th century Victorian groom was a brute, apt to do harm to his new bride if he wasn't careful. However, the 1920s... Nevertheless, the cultural the shame associated room, with the honeymoon seemed the to be changing into something to be more open. At. The transition decades of the 1920s through the 1950s really left the private wedding tour of the 19th century behind and moved into the more public, populist honeymoon of the post-World War II era. 
More than just the bride and groom and immediate families were interested in the honeymoon now. Now tourist promoters, journalists, filmmakers, and especially doctors were intensely interested in peering inside the heterotopia of the honeymoon. The 1920s was also a growth period for tourism. Vacations became a pastime of the middle class. It was not solely reserved for the upper class anymore. This period saw a change in the honeymoon as it became a cultural necessity for the middle class as a prelude to marital life. Although the honeymoon was changing, the car we shouldn't really be that surprised. In places Historian like Nancy Inns Cott and has Drive demonstrated in her book Public Vows that marriage has always been a public institution. Since America's founding, directives about the necessity of marriage and its proper form have been deeply embedded in national policy, law, and political rhetoric. Legislators and judges have Force their preferred model of marriage, consensual heterosexual monogamy, uh, a model based on Christian teachings and English common law. After World War II, the sexual politics of the era were shaped by the enthusiastic public emergence of the ideal, white, happy, heterosexual couple, just as much as they were by the demonization of the pathological homosexual, the wayward girl, the Negro, butch, beat, insert, you know, scary person here. Katz argues, quote, the term heterosexual manufactured a new sex differentiated ideal of the erotically correct a norm that worked to affirm the superiority of men over women and heterosexuals over homosexuals in post-war america and canada the honeymoon became an extension of the wedding and like a car a television set or a set of china the honeymoon trip became for many an affordable consumer good this boom period during However, the 1940s the more and 50s visible the honeymoon became, the more and publicity people about wished honeymooning to define in Falls what it was, was supposed everywhere. to look like. First, it involved travel, it involved privacy, and it involved plenty of sex. However, as more people participated and as the ritual attained wider cultural visibility, the meaning, purpose, and main features of the honeymoon came under serious scrutiny. Doctors, psychiatrists, and other marital, quote-unquote, experts led the debate. No longer were sex manuals written with chaste titles, such as what a young husband ought to know. After the war, these experts spread their wisdom far and wide in newspapers and magazines, how-to films, and radio shows. Experts combined conservative gender roles with optimistic predictions of heterosexual pleasure in the marriage. Sexual compatibility was, as one columnist wrote, the cement that binds a home together. And so this put a lot of pressure on performance during the honeymoon. Expert warned that a bad honeymoon might cause lifelong impotence or for females, honeymoon shock. One Canadian sex expert warned, more psychological damage may be done on the honeymoon than the balance of life can correct. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. That was good stuff. Um, But at the same time that the honeymoon was being described in explicitly sexual terms, American Dr. Alfred Kinsey and his research team were finding that about 50% of women and up to 90% of men were going into their honeymoons as non-virgins, or at least less innocent than popular culture suggested. He also found that hetero and homosexuality were not dual, either or polarities, but existed on a spectrum. Nevertheless, advice givers continued to address honeymooning couples as sexually innocent, strictly heterosexual, and bound by conservative gender roles. Men were encouraged to take charge, although with restraint. Victorian advice discouraged men from being brutes and raping their uninitiated or timid wives on their wedding nights. During the post-war years, men were still advised to tread cautiously, but women were often deemed just as responsible for a bad honeymoon experience as a husband was. 
Popular sex expert Lois Pemberton explained that, quote, the bride's reticence leads the husband to act overly aggressive. He feels that he must use force in order to assert his masculinity. To bring this point home, that women should engage and enjoy sex, lest her husband be compelled to use brute force against her. Uh, Lois Pemberton related the story of Barbara and Jimmy, who Gross. had been separated since Jimmy had but raped his new bride on their wedding night. But experts also about male Pemberton performance wasn't and sure argued a groom was under much more pressure than a bride on their wedding night. Um, the bride, they reasoned, essentially just had to exist. Just lay there, right? Uh, several experts cited marital stage fright or honeymoon impotence as a serious issue for newlywed men. As in other eras, conformity to gender roles was part of the script. The notion that women and men had vastly different sexual appetites was still widely held, and consequences of toying with gender boundaries were severe. One psychiatrist related the sad tale of Ralph and Laura. It seems Ralph was seized with panic on his wedding night, causing Laura to take control. And she, quote, attempted to make a success of their nuptial night. Disappointment ensued, causing Laura and Ralph to retreat to separate sides of the bed. Their brooding silence established an abyss between them. That abyss became a gulf that they never really spanned until 10 years later when Ralph visited a psychiatrist for his apparent shock and decade-long distress at experiencing his new wifey trying to write him cowboy style, I guess, the 10 years previous. <laughs> he should have thanked her. <laughs> So thus, doctors inserted themselves into the honeymoon bedroom. As early as the 1930s, almost all sex experts were recommending the premarital exam in order to avoid things like venereal disease, but also to avoid what some termed marital maladjustment. Assumptions about gender ultimately reproduced cultural stereotypes of passionless women, or her slutty doppelganger, and virile, passionate men. The new male ideal should be a man who gently initiated his bride into the pleasures of sex, while, of course, still being in charge. No cowgirl style. This also, of course, ignores the fact from the Kinsey study in that a majority of couples were the New York already Times asserted that no other place in America well attracts so many married nights. couples as Niagara Falls. By the 1940s and 50s, post-World War II tourism to the falls focused even more heavily on advertising to honeymooners, and the post-war increase in marriages certainly helped business. Hotel owners would scour marriage announcements in newspapers and send invitations to the bride-to-be to come to Niagara Falls for her honeymoon. Honeymooners in both the U.S. and Canada could get a honeymoon certificate when they arrived. Canada invested over a billion dollars post-war into Niagara Falls in order to attract American tourists, and 13 million people visited the falls in 1953 alone. A lot of people. Why? <laughs> I just don't understand. <laughs> it's so weird. Um, so post-war pop culture helped establish the mass appeal of the honeymoon at Niagara Falls. As the honeymoon became a cultural metaphor for sex... So did Niagara Falls, as mentioned at the top of the episode with Cary Grant's crude allusion to the city from 1955. In 1953, the movie Niagara, starring Marilyn Monroe, proved a huge boon to the Niagara Falls travel industry. The movie poster echoed the allusions to the falls as a raging, dangerous, and enticing female. The poster shows Monroe arching over the waterfall with the caption, Marilyn Monroe and Niagara, a raging torrent of emotion that even nature can't control. Journalists alluded that honeymooners in Niagara Falls were dazed, walking into traffic, forgetting to tip their waiters, and generally lackadaisical because of all the sex they were having. 
The intense honeymoon oh, ever. promotions the by Niagara Falls kitsch of the 40s were major and 50s in the became the cliche of the, of the 1960s, couple. and Niagara Falls began a very slow decline. Jet travel made it easier for couples to travel to further destinations, and places like the nearby Poconos in Pennsylvania became new destinations for newlyweds. Journalists and cultural commentators began discussing Niagara Falls as a has-been. Class and race also became issues, and more affluent honeymooners traveled to places like Hawaii and the Florida Keys, making Niagara Falls a destination the upper classes thumbed their noses at. Concurrently, the area began a downward spiral as industry left and environmental atrocities like those at Love Canal marred the region. What was once a, a thriving industrial hub with electricity powered by the falls and staples like Nabisco shredded wheat were made by the ton have now become somewhat of a ghost town, at least on the American side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Nabisco started out in Massachusetts and then moved there in like the early. Shredded wheat was made in Niagara century. Falls. <laughs> oh my God, my mind is blown. For many, the thought of Niagara Falls is mundane, boring cliche. Perhaps that's why it was fitting for the offices Pam and Jim to be married on the Maid of the Mist steamboat under the falls. The Office is a show about the mundane and everyday interactions of random people shoved together in a small office space and the interactions that they have together. Jim and Pam represent the white every couple, middle of the road, good old fashioned Americans that still believe in marriage and family, even as they bucked the traditionalists and were pregnant before their wedding day. Opposite of Isabel's mortification of being outed as a bride embarking on her sexual journey, Jim and Pam were the quintessential the heterosexual couple performing their sexuality in the honeymoon <laughs> capital of the world. The end. I have 17 things to say. First, I had never been anywhere except for a class trip to Europe and, of course, Canada, because we were Vermonters. But when my senior year, my parents took us on the first ever family vacation that we'd ever taken because we were like poor people. And we went to the Finger Lakes in central New York and like rented a little house there. But then we went to Niagara Falls, Canada for like a long weekend. And that was the first time I'd ever been to Western New York. Mm -hmm. And then... 10 years later, I ended up here for a PhD. So that was super weird. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've been here before. Okay, so. And then second. Like you, I had, I, I okay, so I had I never. I forgot. I'll have to come back to I it. I grew up, I Go. grew up in Texas. I think I've made that abundantly clear a gazillion times, right? So, so the whole Northeast was just a uh, enigma to me. I didn't understand it. And so it wasn't until we moved to Buffalo in 20, I don't know. 12 or something like that that i had ever been to niagara falls like we moved here and then i was like oh that's right niagara falls is here and it's really close i didn't know that so so all of my experiences of niagara falls are as an adult i have to say i love it and it is the most bizarre place i have ever been in my entire life niagara falls at least on the on the state side on the new york side it, it's a very sad city. The city is in disrepair. There's no tax base. Like 90% of the houses are condemned. Like it's, it's very, very, very sad. The little space around like the quote unquote tourist space on the U S side is the, the most bizarre collection of <laughs> strange storefronts and restaurants that I've ever seen, seen in my entire life. It's just bizarre. It's very bizarre. And I don't know if I can even describe it um, because it's so bizarre. Yes. It's yes. It's not, I don't know. It's like a dirt mall kind of like, does this, <laughs> you, okay. Like, you know what I mean with a dirt mall, like chasing Amy. Like, it's like, it's like when the mall has not, the mall is not the yeah, mall anymore, but okay. it now has all these like little independent stores in it. Right. So the mall's like on the, so, so it's like that on the American side. However, I will say about the American side, 
they have the better yeah. um, nature part of it. So they've, they've yeah. put a lot of work into the, the actual park surrounding the falls. So for those of you who haven't been there and are thinking yeah. about going there, like definitely the American side has a really nice, like kind of nature walk and everything like that. See the falls. Oh, that's beautiful. I didn't know yes. that. And our friends, so then Catherine you travel and over to the Canadian got side in the park and it's even on more the American bizarre. side. Yeah. It's casinos, although the American side has a casino too. And it's, it's fairly nice. It's a fairly nice casino. Okay. But then you're on the, on the Canadian side, like all the yep. hotels, like the Sheridan and the big hotels have their own casinos. So those casinos are, are a little bit nicer. And then there's this thing called Clifton Hill, which has, again, the most yes. bizarre set of tourist attraction ever. It's like all these wax museums and haunted houses yep. and... <laughs> <laughs> and like Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> and a rainforest cafe. It's just so, it's weird, but I love it because it's so kitschy. Rainforest it's so cafe. Kitschy. And with little kids, like my, our kids oh, completely enjoy it. But we also love so, doing stuff like yeah. that. We'll go into the haunted yeah. houses with them. Like, but we're, we're also into that stuff for the sweetness wizard golf wizard golf is great it's black light golf that's like knock off harry potter <laughs> so yeah. everything's knock off but- by the way <laughs> nothing is like name brand i think rainforest cafe is like the oh. only name brand thing <laughs> for the- yes. oh that's on the american side which is odd oh there's yeah, hard, they actually both do. Both have. Too, I think. We are so digressing. Like we're just rambling. That's now, on but the Ameri- yeah, both, Oh, but the American but side you also You have has to a go to this cafe, place. It's so weird, really weird. Yeah. because you have this awesome, yeah, but natural. No. What is it? Yeah. Site or whatever. Like the falls really are amazing. I find them to be very amazing. And when in, in certain places where you can get up really close to them, like I just find them simply amazing. Yeah. And then there's this weird cultural smorgasbord around it that is just very bizarre it is very and i think the canadian side too you can see how Mm -hmm. different the city is like because you know you have the weird super super weird touristy stuff that's like all along the the waterfront and up clifton hill but then even if you go outside of that super no. touristy stuff like the rest of there's niagara still, falls the city yeah there's in still Canada, industry in there there's still is not as the houses aren't as sucked decrepit. dry but i mean it's also it's Canada like there's still it's still breathing <laughs> yeah 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 Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and and that, you know, maybe Niagara Falls, America versus Canada is the story of the divergences of these two nations. Yeah. The difference between. But it's also very strange to me because that America has the side where the. the Yeah, you would think they'd be they'd be switched. Um, And Canada goes the complete opposite way. Like there's. And I and I wish I could put. Yeah, it's a very strange place. What it is. Uh, my um i don't know she's not sister-in-law because she's not married to my brother Mm -hmm. my my sister my brother's partner um loves to go to niagara falls like she'll she comes out here a couple times a year just from vermont just to go to the falls with her like we do that all the time we take little we take little vacations over there and we'll stay one night and and then they go home and that's like it's really cheap it's like 60 Crazy. 70 bucks and we go and we just putz around and eat out and it's so much fun but it's so weird it's that's true <laughs> yeah well we do both yes. i mean we can't we because we have the little kids we i, can't go, go I mean the casino, i have a different relationship but we go do all the other go for the like, natural beauty i go like, for like stupid casino. stuff like we'll ride we'll play oh, putt okay. golf and we'll ride the ferris wheel and you know it's just it's just it's it's pure consumption you know conspicuous consumption Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, the last thing I did. I do know one couple that that honeymooned in Niagara Falls in the 60s as it was dying off. They're, uh, my friend's parents, um, she's like a surprise baby who was born 15 years after her brother's. Um, so her parents are older. And she, one day on Facebook, I was talking about Niagara Falls. Wait, so like, they honeymooned oh, there man, in like the 90s my husband, then? The 90s. We, we honeymooned there and it was, you know, like a Oh, I thought you said her parents were, like, were oh, born in the 60s or 70s. How strange. They were married no, in the 60s and like or 70s. The, like the 70s, 60s, late 60s, so. early 70s. <laughs> and then she no, no, went back and honeymooned then. there herself? Yeah. Oh, 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 I see. Oh, right. No, no, no. She did anymore. not. But so, so just her parents did. I don't like know. I mean, maybe if ago. I would have grown up, here, so, I feel like we so never Jason hear about I, people. We went to Vegas, and we did it very much like doing this. it anymore. Like we didn't yeah. elope. We planned a trip to Vegas. It was like Jim and Pam's wedding. Like our families and everybody went out to Vegas. But you know, maybe if we had been here, we would have done it there. I don't know. Interesting. I also wonder how, I mean, there's, this wasn't part of this episode, but um, since same-sex marriage was so legalized Dubinsky in Canada so much earlier, into, I wonder how um, much they had an explosion gay and of lesbian couples Americans. getting married in the falls and how it was kind of like, there was this little boom of it, but it was kind of like being ironic in a way, like, look at us in this like mecca of heterosexuality and we're kind of like flaunting the norms i mean almost like oscar wilde and walt Whitman were doing in the 19th century mm. um this this kind of like flaunting of heterosexuality but she doesn't really get into it too much so go for it i like that i feel like that's <sighs> a excellent second project that someone anywho no, I don't want to do American Canadian stuff. <laughs> yeah. And if you anyway, haven't so, gone, yeah. I don't want Thanks the Niagara for Falls coming on this weird like, Niagara Falls journey with us. Mad at us. I, you should go. It's a really, <laughs> oh, it's a weird, weird, weird and awesome place to visit. Yeah, I think you should. Yeah, you go should go. if you go. Have your passport so you can do both sides. Yeah, I, either side. Honestly, that is true. We did we mention we're we're recording this in in COVID mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. once Canada's reopened. That yes. is, so we are in quarantine at the moment. Talking about people getting it on. No, we did not. Re we did not mention that right now. Yeah. Yes, a part. Yeah, it's the right time to do it. When else should you have this conversation? So, thanks for listening. And thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our 100th episode. So congratulations to us. And thank you all for listening for over these last months or days or three years, if you've been with us since the beginning. We really appreciate your support. As always, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. We're at dig underscore history. You can shop in our swag store at TeePublic. We'll have a special t-shirt design, especially for this episode being our 100th, uh, celebrating sex at Niagara Falls. So check that out and get one for yourself if you're so inclined. Uh, you can support our podcast by becoming a member of our Himalaya member community on the Himalaya app. You can get that through the app store. You can also support us through Patreon. And other than that, we hope that you... We'll leave us a pleasant review and rating upon the iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, because we want you to help other people find these Thank super you weird for episodes to listening. enjoy in their homes and cars Bye -bye. and laundry walkings. Goodbye. This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, no, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa no Rhodes, way. and me, Avril Earls. Dog. Thanks for listening. What are you doing down here? Go back to your dungeon, doggy. So bad. Even as early as 1841, a pop. Oh, it is. I think so. Oh, wait, that's still me. American no, 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 doctor Google. Alfred Kinsey. Google machine.
Is that his name? Alfred? Alfred? Alfred can't Okay. That actually... No, you know what? I need to redo that again See, because super she's weird. describing what the falls is this look like, like there. A sex, like, but this in is her describing first time? the falls. Hold on. I'll go. I'll, I'll explain all that in a little bit. Yeah. It sounds. Yes, like that's she, that's the thing. That's okay, the. Because it sounds like she did that work out okay? The first time of having when sex, I went back and no read experience of sex said what she's thinking about the falls. Yeah. And I'm sorry, it looked like I had two of me, so anyway. I don't know. I say basil, but it's probably basil. <clears throat> is it basil or is it basil? It's alright. We'll stick with basil. Tastes better anyway. 